Okay, we're all dried up and ready to get flocking on our bird. For a drape mallard, which is what we're gonna do first, um, the color that I use on the body, it's Rust-Oleum colors, gloss, of course. Um, I, I've done them a little bit of every which way you can imagine. Um, what I've settled on for my personal birds and most of the things that, that I do, if someone doesn't specifically say, hey, I want a late season mallard or I want a dark drake mallard, is I will mix um, two parts gloss white with one part smoke gray. Both Rust-Oleum colors. I just got an old paint can here that I mix and drape gray. You can kind of see the color on the side. It's just a very uh, light looking gray. Um, it, it actually is about the color of the, uh, the primer itself. And for the first coat, I do the entire bird, head, tail, whole works in this color. Um, for our second coat, we'll go back and we will do just the body in gray. And then finally, we'll do just the tail and just the head in black. And we'll be ready to, to airbrush the bird, which you've seen on some of the other videos or we'll see eventually, hopefully, if you decide to stick with me. So for this bird, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, the brushes that I use, um, I do not use expensive paint brushes for this. It's absolutely asinine to use anything that's expensive. So I use a lot of these little acid etch brushes or acid brushes. Uh, they're usually found either in the paint department or with, um, with soldering and welding. Um, you can buy 36 of them in a little bag at Harbor Freight for like $1.79. Um, and then I use chip brushes. This one I actually cut down to uh, make the bristles a little bit stiffer. Um, it's been used several times for several different things. It looks like I used it to wrestle coat some birds because it looks like it's got glue on it, but it's clean, it's dry, it's ready to go. The bristles aren't falling out of it. Um, and they're cheap too. Six bucks will buy you like 30 of them. So, uh, you know, at first some of the bristles will fall out. So keep a little pair of tweezers handy to pick some of the little furs off of it. But uh, we'll get started. Make sure I'm zoomed in here good so you guys can see. That'll work well. You don't need to see me after that. Uh, I ain't much to look at. So, I'll just start on the front of the bird and I'll get some paint off my lid first just because I'm cheap like that. So, I'll, I'll take my acid brush first and just kind of go right up alongside of the face. Right down along below the eye. Being careful not to paint the eye. This is where you. This is about the only spot where you got to be really careful. After that, you can pretty much just lay it on there pretty quick. Right up into the little V of the head. In the same color. One thing you'll notice about me is I tend to be kind of thrifty when it comes to my colors. Um, this is the same color that I use on the chest and the side pockets of Canada geese. It's a real useful color to have, but of course it's the color I use the most anyway, because um, of all the birds that I do, that customers have me do, Drake mallards and Canada geese are number one and number two on that. Uh, popularity list. Of course, they're two of the most hunted waterfowl species anyway, especially here in the Eastern Flyway. So once we're past our eyes and past our bill, we can put the detail brush away and get after the serious work. with the big brush. And if you were ever wondering where, where all the, the paint on my clothes comes from and why I'm always wearing the same beat up ratty sweatshirt and the pants that look like, you know, my pockets are falling through them because they're, they're flannel lined. These pants have probably killed more ducks than a lot of y'all have ever seen. 
I've been to Canada four or five times and all over hell and back and they're just comfortable getting broken in but they're pretty much my work pants so there's no point in messing up something that uh works right back to thrifty again so and we'll take the big brush and we'll just come from the water line and come on up come on up the chest Now, normally when I do this, I've always got a respirator on. Same thing with airbrushing. And naturally, wearing that respirator, you guys wouldn't be able to hear me explain what it is I'm up to. So I've got my little social distancing COVID face piece on or neck gaiter or whatever the heck these things are called. Neck buff or whatever it is. It keeps people from freaking out when I walk in a grocery store and I'm so used to having it on now between here and the fire station that I just almost feel naked without it but uh for the purposes today it'll protect me a little bit while still letting y'all hear me and if you don't have a respirator um definitely wear something like this or a bandana or an N95 uh, I know you've heard me say before you only get one pair of lungs please take care of yourselves um this nylon flocking is really really nasty stuff and uh, between flocking and firefighting and bourbon, I'm probably destined for a cancer ward someday anyway. But still, take care of yourself and prolong your life and your quality of life. And this stuff gets in your lungs. There's There's been some horror stories in some of the decoy groups that I've been a part of from people that uh, didn't properly protect themselves, and especially from guys that did it in their house. And some people have actually gotten their entire family sick. That nylon is no joke. And you make sure that when you buy flocking, you buy nylon flocking, not rayon flocking. Nylon is much more durable. Holds its color a lot better. You get a much better product. It's about the same price, too. So for outdoor stuff, make sure you uh, use that nylon. If you're in the house building model railroads or whatever, then you can use the rayon. That's fine. But nylon for outdoor use so just that quick there's a uh, there's a properly coated Drake Mallard you got all the paint on him and everything now when it's really cold it's not a good idea to do this at all but when it's colder you can actually put this one down and go and coat another one then come back and flock him because it lets that paint settle out a little bit but because it's warm today you don't really have to wait for that warm enough anyway so that's what he looks like. So now, I'm gonna put my paint down. Make sure we're still, yep, you'll be able to see just fine. Pull my mask up. Safe. Now I use these bins because it, it catches the flocking that doesn't stick to the bird. So in the long run, it ends up saving me a lot of trouble, a lot of money, uh, and it just keeps the colors together. So uh, granted, I do a lot more of this than a lot of y'all probably do. So if you have one bin and you can just swap the colors out as you need them, that probably works well. But uh, this goose gray color, really good color just kind of a kind of brown kind of gray but not really either one it's influenced greatly by the paint you put underneath it so um this is the same color that we use on hen mallards believe it or not which there's actually a hen pintail sitting next to me i don't know if you can see it or not but same colors on that uh it changes by the color you put underneath it. so all you're going to do is this is just some little thing that i stole from my wife's kitchen it's got little holes in the bottom, the little flower sifters that you can buy at, at Food Line or Walmart in the kitchen aisle are perfect. Um, it helps break the clumps up and helps keep it even. So all I do is I just sift it over nice and even. Give it a little shake. And normally I hold it down in the bin, but since you, so you guys can see it, I'm holding it up a little bit more.
that's it. That's all there is to it. Give a little tap off, a little shake. Walk back around here so you can see him a little better. There he is. That's coat one right there. So it looks pretty good right now when you put the second coat on. The second coat takes longer for sure because it that paint has to soak in a little bit more. Um, you'll see here in a few minutes. Uh, that'll really make him pop and add a lot to the durability. So, um, But now he's got to dry for a few days. So I'm going to take him outside and put him in the sun and let him cure up. And uh, today's Monday. We'll probably reconvene on about Thursday, maybe Friday or so. And, uh, and we'll do the second coat. In the meantime, we can, uh, we'll do a hen as well. So you can see the, uh, comparisons there. Not much different. Same, same thing, same idea, but, uh, yep, that's it. Coat one in the books. We're going to go ahead and do the hen mallard next. Uh, this is the herder's foam. So this is how you're going to do a foam decoy, already primed, already ready to go. So no, uh, no problems there with the oil or anything. Um, and one other thing that I really want to point out to you guys is when you put your, your paint on for flocking, you've got to brush it on. It has to be full thickness. Don't thin it and spray it. Um, don't get uh, caught up in, you know, trying to save a little bit of time there. Um, you want it to be good and thick and, uh, that, that thickness is going to equate to toughness. So, uh, you know, flock decoys are not quite as durable as plastic decoys are anyway. Doing it this way makes it a lot more durable compared to that factory fly Chinese flocking. Much, much more durable, but it's still, uh, it needs to be done the right way. So make sure that you're not spraying on your coats of paint. Um, we're using gloss almond for a hen. Um, and then we're going to use goose gray flocking. And this is true on uh, hens of most species. So um, uh, mallards, pintails, um, we use a little bit different mix for a, uh, a wood duck. But uh, we still use the, the goose gray flocking. We just use a, a little bit different paint underneath to give it a little bit darker color. Um, I do the same for uh, hen canvas backs. I use the same mixture. Uh, Bluebills get a, a different mix. They get a color uh, that's brown and brown. Um, and some guys will actually do their hens uh, leather brown and then feather brown, which makes them really good and dark. And then they and then they paint the light. That works for some people. Um, it has not worked for me. I've tried it. It just the way that I airbrush. I don't know what it is. Uh, that I do differently because I've seen guys do it that way and they can do it really quick and it looks really good, which is kind of the point. But um, for me personally, this way just works a whole lot better. So This paint's kind of thin for professional grade Rust-Oleum. A little thinner than I'd certainly like to see, but that's why we do two coats. You can tell it's dripping all over the place off the brush. That's why I wear old clothes. So we're getting coated. Mask up. Just like before, just shake her on.
there it is. Flocked body. And that's just the first coat. Of course, we're gonna go back and put the second coat on after it dries for a few days, cures up. Should be ready to go. Now that that's done. I'm going to uh, show you guys the head, which is done the same way. This is our head that's nice and dry. The bill paint, the primer. Get my little brush here, it's all cleaned up from using the gray. Same thing. Give my paint a little swirl here. We're just gonna, just like with the mallet, we're just gonna brush it right straight on. Being careful to avoid the eye. When I get up here, what I usually do is the duck has two things that kind of come down that way. A little road bristle there um so what i like to do usually is i'll just use the brush itself and i'll just take it and touch it right there and just touch it right there again that way i get a nice v down the the duck's face just like a real duck has and just keep right on going you get some over the eyes by accident if you go a little too hard in the paint, so to speak, pardon the pun. Um, you can take a Q-tip, and a Q-tip will uh, will take it right off pretty quick. And that way you don't have to go back and try and scrape the paint off later on when you go to paint the eyes. have to take this paint back up to the hardware store and get them to shake it or something because it is uh i think it'll be starting to separate on me a little bit usually it's thicker than this but it's probably good for you guys to see it because i'm gonna go ahead and probably do another hen with a different batch of paint see if it's any different and then you guys can see the difference so that as you go over the years sooner or later you will find and i've, I've talked to people i still haven't found one or maybe i have now um a bad batch of paint that just doesn't work right so um, I don't know how this will hold after it cures. I'm going to give it the old endurance test and see how it works. If it holds up okay, then no problem. But, uh, it looks from all the birds I've done, this paint does look noticeably thinner than it usually does. You can see how, you can kind of see through it in places. That's not normal. Normally it coats it up really good. So we'll, uh, we'll do this one and see what happens. Just like everything else, just take it and give it a shake. So I'm going to grab that other uh, tangle free mallard that we primed the other day and we'll uh, we'll do a coat on it real fast and uh, I'll show you guys the difference because I'm thinking that this paint might be a little bad or I might not have mixed it right so uh, it'll be a good lesson uh, for anybody that ever runs into it you'll know what it looks like and how to fix it.
Okay, after further review, I definitely think that paint needed a little bit more uh, shaking or, or mixing. So um, I got a can of uh, the same stuff that's just a little bit older. I was almost, almost out of it, so I bought that new can the other day, and it was on the front. So I just kind of grabbed it, not even thinking about it. Um, but uh, this older stuff is much thicker. So this will show you the difference between a paint that's either not properly mixed or maybe even bad paint. I don't think that it's necessarily bad, um, but I normally like it a little bit thicker. So it might just need to thicken up a little bit. Um, I'll just run it up to the store here in a little bit and they'll shake it for me. No big deal. Um, yeah, I'm sure it'll be just fine. But uh, this is some stuff that's actually been shaken properly. That I'm getting ready to show you here. So small acid brush. Um, same deal right around the face, just like with the Drake. We're going to start right up here. You can see immediately how much thicker this paint is and how it goes on. It doesn't run all over the place. You got good solid coverage. That's what you're looking for, as opposed to uh, that other was a little bit thinner. So no big deal. Just recognize it and correct it and go on down the road. So uh, not a lot to learn here other than, uh, you know, what you've already seen on the Drake. So I think I'm going to go ahead and high speed it. And uh, that way you can save yourself a little bit of time. All right, so we're wrapping it up here on this uh, hen paint application. And you can probably tell how much thicker it is. This is what it should look like. Good thick paint coverage. That's what you should have. And I've still got the tape from uh, doing the bill on since I had to put it on there and leave it on there anyway to... Uh, to prime them, go ahead and leave it on until you're completely done. That way it protects it and it gives you a little something extra to grab onto just in case you need it. Sometimes you find yourself fumbling. I'm a, uh, I'm pretty clumsy in case you hadn't noticed. It's why I'm a firefighter and not a major league baseball player.
among other reasons. So just like the other ones, just shake it right on. Make sure that you get good coverage from all angles. I forgot to put my mask on. I got a big clump of it right up my snout. Not doing me any favors. Um, because the paint will collect down in the low spots with all these parts carved in. So make sure that you get a uh, good coverage in there. A little tap off, little shake off. There you go. And mallard. So we'll uh, let all this stuff dry. And we'll catch you in a day or two for the next part, coat number two, where the real work begins. Now that I got all the flocking off my face uh, from that last segment, that was pretty funny. I guess I must have touched my face when I had some flocking on my hands. Um, I had a good mustache of it. I couldn't figure out where it was coming from. Hope y'all got a good laugh out of that. And, uh, but it also shows you the importance of wearing that mask. And I actually think that when I pulled my mask up is when I did it. So, um, anyway, moving on, uh, coat number two on the Drake Mallard. Today, we're just going to do the body minus the head and the tail, which is going to be done, uh, in a couple of days in black. So I got a piece of chalk here and chalk is really useful. If you've seen some other videos for laying out feather groups, same deal here. I'm just going to kind of establish a line here that I'm not going to go past. So this is where my, my black is going to start and my gray is going to end on the bird. And this way it just gives me a target line. And of course, chalk, you can either use your, your air, uh, air gun to blast it right away, or uh, you can just paint right over it. And the first time the bird gets wet, it's going to get rinsed away anyway. So uh, obviously we're not going to do the wings here, but we are going to do the, the, um, this in, in black. So that line is gonna be right here along the wing and then it's gonna to come to about right here on the rump. That's gonna be gray and the rest is gonna be black. So everything else, all this between the chalk lines here is what we're doing today. And that's gonna be that gray. Um, and when we come back and do our black, you'll see that it won't matter that it was gray underneath it. All it did was save us a, a day or two of dry time. So, um, just like before, um, I will show you how much extra work it is to get the second coat on because the flocking that's already on there soaks it up. You can see before I could just, you know, zip right through this, you know, one little brush of paint would do half the bird almost. Well, I've already got to get more paint on my brush and that's all it did right there. So you're going to use a lot more paint doing second coats, but it's worth it. Um, now there is a pitfall here to know because you can in fact, use too much paint, especially with hens. For whatever reason, that almond color and goose gray, um, it'll bleed through really bad and it'll almost look like it's pilling up on you. And uh, when that happens, you have used too much paint. Um, so you wanna brush it on and then let it settle for a minute or two, let it sit. So that the oil, oil paint tends to spread itself out naturally. It, it lays down nice and flat, doesn't require a whole heck of a lot of working. Um, so while that's happening, um, you can actually start on another bird if you like. Um, and dang near, no matter how hot it is, as long as you're not in direct sunlight, you'll be fine. But you know, it can be 90 degrees in the shade here in Virginia sometimes. And the birds don't dry too quickly because of the amount of paint on them. On the first coat, they will. First coat, you usually, if it's, if it's warm, you don't want to wait long at all. You want to go on and get the flocking on there so your paint doesn't start to dry or tack up because then the flocking won't stick to it. So all I'm doing here is just working it in. There's one of those bristles came out of my brush. Kind of knock it away. You see it hanging off my paintbrush. It happens. Even with high-end brushes, it happens. 
But the reason I use these cheap brushes that are stiffer is because I can actually move the paint over more effectively. I have to go back to the paint can a little bit more than I might with a, with a higher end brush that holds more paint, but I waste less paint as well. Um, cause those brushes hold a heck of a lot of paint and they're really tough to get clean. I can clean this brush in 30 seconds and use it for another color almost immediately. Um, or, you know, it's like a 30 cent brush. I can always just toss it if I need to, if I drop it on the floor or whatever, you know, I go through a lot of them. You know, your, your kid needs a snack and you put it down and it gets dry on you or whatever. That's life. Might have been off camera a little bit, but there we go. Hopefully that helps a little bit. One of these days I'll get me a camera, man. In the meantime, it's just you and me, kids. We're gonna go right to the edge of the wing. And even though nobody will ever see it or notice it, it's good to actually complete the ring down here because it's extra protection. You don't want to have that, you don't want your flocking to really have an edge where something could grab it and start trying to peel it because it'll it'll stick together almost like a, uh, almost like moss on a rock uh, is, is what it looks like. And um, when it, if it ever does, you know, start to get damaged or peel or anything, which it can, you know, if you start getting water underneath it, it can uh it can definitely come off on you again it's way tougher than the chinese stuff lasts a lot longer looks a lot better but you got to take care of it and it's got to be done right or it ain't worth doing and it ain't no good at all so the last thing that i do especially with the hens when i've got my second coat and this goes for heads tails you name it um is I'll take and I'll just kind of go over it with, with no paint on the brush at all. I mean, you know, there's residual residue on here, but I just go over it and kind of smooth everything out. And that's getting off. You can see it bunching up there near the metal on the brush. That's getting off the excess paint that's on the bird that we don't need. That extra is just going to create clumps and make the dry time longer. And sometimes you'll see it on the bird itself. You can see those shiny spots right there. That's, that's where there's too much paint. And you can see it all getting caught in the brush. So I just go and wipe it back on the edge of the can and let it drip back down into there for next time. A little bit up there on the chest is a little bit too much. But that's about good. All right. So I mask up for safety, hopefully without blocking my face this time. And same deal, just, just like we've been doing. And you'll be able to see pretty quick, and you'll definitely be able to see when we come back to do the head and chest in another day or two, um, or the head and the tail, the difference between one coat of flocking and two and how much difference it makes and how much better it looks and subsequently how much tougher it is. There's some guys out there that do three. I think three is a little excessive. And I think you start to start to look less like a duck and more like a teddy bear when you start getting a three on there, but two is, two is enough. All right. Another thing I'll usually do with my second coats. As soon as I'm done, I'll take my, my blow gun. Not real heavy. This is about 40 PSI. Just kind of go over it. That'll get some of the loose stuff out, but it'll also push some of that flocking down into the paint. Just kind of help it bond together a little bit better. But you can 
see already the difference in that line between the tail and the, and the butt and the wing and the butt and along the head. That looks much better, much more durable, much more even. That's what you should look like after coat number two.